Uh, my name is Laird Klingler. I'm a librarian with the Cornish Historical Society. The date is April 20th, 2017. Uh, we're at the home of Peter and Caroline Storrs. Thank you for inviting us. And uh, Billy Scharf will be doing the uh, interviewing. We always like to start with uh, asking uh, where and when you were born. Uh, Peter? Uh, uh, born in Hanover um, in 1951. Caroline? I was born in Torrance, California in 1952. 52. Uh, Peter, let's um, let's go back uh, in time with you a little. Um, you come from more of the little north in Hanover, but but you, through an ancestor, have a link to Cornish in its uh, right. earliest days. Uh, could you tell us about that, please? Um, it would be my seven greats grandfather was a surveyor and worked for the governor um, uh, in. 1760 and 61 and surveyed a series of towns in the upper valley all north of um, Fort number four as soon as it became semi-safe to go north of the fort um, Including Cornish was paid for his um, for his time and his skill with a uh, with a lot that is um, on the hill um, uh, And I think I think it's a little hard to tell looking at the proprietor's map, but I think it's um, uh, Colleen's land now. Mm. Um, it's pretty mm. vertical, pretty rocky, um, not down by the river. Um, Those are the choice areas. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Governor kept that for himself. Mm. And po Colleen, Colleen's property is included in that, you think? I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. But um, the stores is on the proprietor's map, which is is how we knew that he was doing this area. And then he, I guess he got, um, he's on uh, throughout the the valley here from um, yeah. all the series of towns going up along the Connecticut River. And then he chose one in Hanover and Lebanon. He, ne he never lived in the in oh, this he didn't live here. Okay. valley. His kids did. Oh, that's right. In both Lebanon and Hanover. Mm -hmm. um, moved here in the 60s. I remember one time at the uh, History Center, because we have the map, the proprietor's map. Right. I remember you were looking for the yeah. map. Right, right. Yeah. right. Peter noticed it when we sort first came to town. Yeah. yeah. And uh, saw the name and was like, oh yeah. my goodness, that's just. Yeah. Well, Carolyn, so let's go, go back in time, not as far as with, <laughs> with Peter, but. Um, your mother was a nurse with the Red Cross during World War II, and we have her uh, diary, you know, of course, at, at the center. Tell us about what you know about your mother's experiences there, Hannah Shad. Um, she was born in Hatfield, Mass., which is about 100 miles south of here, and uh, uh, her father raised tobacco, as a lot of um, um, farmers did in the, um, the Connecticut River Valley, because it was very rich land, and it was the it was broadleaf tobacco, which is the outer wrapping for cigars. And there's only a few places that you can actually grow that type of crop, and uh, the Connecticut River is one of them. And uh, so she grew up in Hatfield, and uh, uh, um, in a house that um, her parents and parents before her um, it, it's been in the family for 300 years, and it still is in the family. Um, but she um, graduated from college uh, during the Depression, and then she didn't know what to do, so she decided to become a, a Red Cross nurse. And she was stationed out in Hawaii, and then she was out in Kwajalein, uh, the island of Kwajalein, in the Pacific. And uh, she was uh, a secretary for, I guess, um, um, officers. And, um, and uh, she just diligently wrote letters home to her mom, uh, my grandmother, um, at least once or uh, twice a month or so on. And my grandmother saved those letters. So we have a, um, a real running story of her adventures as being, um, um, being a nurse during World War II. We still have her uniform. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? And, um, uh, she saved everything from from the war. I'm very happy that we have the diary. Oh, that, that oh that's great. Okay, okay now, now moving moving forward a little, um, Peter, uh, you 
you grew up primarily in Hanover? Oh, we lived in Etna. Etna? Yeah. Well, of course, Hanover would have been your town, right? Correct. Yeah. That's where we went to school. Yeah. Went to school. Tell us a little bit about your childhood in that area and, uh, and, and uh, t about Hanover at that time. Um, as, I mean, as a child, Hanover was just, um, was town. And we weren't there a lot. I went one year to um, the uh, last year of the uh, school in Etna. There was then a two two classroom school, first and second in one grade, and third and fourth in the other. Um, uh, taught by Mrs. White, who I thought was huge and terrifying. <laughs> and when I met her years later at the Hanover Center Fair, she's not either. But um, and. Etna was um, listed in 1960 as a population of 200. There were um, the uh, bulk tank laws came in 1961, and that ended um, all the small farms that had milked three or four cows as as a second income. And uh, but that was the end of the uh, 40 quart jugs being picked up at the end of the driveway. Um, everyone had to have a refrigerated bulk tank and no one could afford that mm -hmm. or none, none of the small farms afforded that so and what was interesting Peter's um, uh, parents house that he grew up in was a boarding house and um, when we first came to Cornish uh, Andy Cure came and said I was born in your parents house Fred Sullivan was and born Fred in that Sullivan house. was yeah. born yeah. in um, really? Peter's really? parents yeah. house and I guess I Mrs. Mean, she, Mrs. Payne was a nurse. She was, yeah, and, a, and a midwife. You would go have your kid and stay for two or three weeks well, and be pampered while, uh, mm. instead of being shuttled out the next day. <laughs> the way, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you did go into Hanover. Yeah. Did has Hanover changed much in oh, the downtown area? Has it the downtown area? We uh, would come out of the uh, movies at the Nugget, and there were no cars parked on Main Street. And I mean, it was empty in the summer. And the college is now um, teaching year round on a quarterly system, and that's, uh, that certainly has changed the, um, the dynamic in Hanover. Um, it is a, um, it's booming along all year round yes. instead of really shutting down in the summer um, the way it used to you and you went to because the, the college was bigger than the population of the undergraduate college was bigger than the population of the town when i um, was in high school which um isn't the case anymore and you went to the nugget theater that was the that absolutely was the, yeah. yeah it's all one big room not divided into four yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he used to rate the fraternities um, when he was a kid to... He used to, to do what? <laughs> to, 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 I'm sorry, to... To raid the fraternities and try to, you know, to party with the, oh, the oh, college to, kids. Oh, trying to get into that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Carla, let's go back in time for you, too, um, as well. Um, your sister, I believe it was your sister Susie, told me a story about the children uh, when you were growing up, going into Fenway Park. Right. Uh, tell, and I know your mother was a great Red Sox fan. Oh, she loved so, the Red Sox. So she, she was, tell about the stories going into Fenway. Yeah, well, she, um, she, uh, she, I think she got into, she really got into the Red Sox when they won the pennant back in the 60s. Um, forget what it was. But she just really got charged about it because we were listening to it as kids. And she um, would listen to it on the radio, but she would... She would drive us to um, the the subway station, which was outside of the um, the, uh, the Boston proper, out in the suburbs, and we would take the subway into town, and then we would walk to Fenway, watch the game. My mother would be listening to it on the radio, and then uh, we'd uh, load up on the subway, and she knew when the game was over, so she would uh, get in the car and meet us back uh, at the end of the, the subway. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was great fun for us because we were just allowed to go in town, which was a big thing to be able to go on no, our own. So we, tell us who we is. Um, my, well, my sister Susan, my 
brother Fred and my other brother Tim and then myself and then we usually had a bunch of kids um, there were other kids on the road that we grew up on that were they're into baseball too so we would all go in as a group so that was you were too young for Ted Williams I'm sure right he he, right, knew about him, but uh, he didn't see him play. At that time. Carl Yastrzemski was big. Oh, Yastrzemski, yes. Um, yes and yes. actually, um, who was the the catcher down here in Charleston? Ooh, you got it. No, Carl Yastrzemski was. Um, he was. Uh, he, no, no, he was out in left field. It, uh, who was the? Oh, oh um, uh, Carlton Fisk. Carlton Fisk. That's right. Was that's the, right. The, the? Oh, he was catching. He was time. catcher at that time. Catching. And yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, it was great because you'd go out into the bleachers. It was three bucks, and it was. Uh, you can't do that at Fenway anymore. Though. Can't do that no, at can't. Fenway. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that was great. Fun. All right, now let's move now to, um, um, for example, as you got older, how did you meet and, and, and get married then? Uh, we met in college, University of Denver, and um, um, I went out for the skiing. Peter went out for the skiing. That's why we chose the the school, and. Uh, um, Peter and I met basically the in the parking lot. In the parking lot, uh, Peter's van had. Uh, I was trying to fix my car, and I looked up, and it was about ninety degrees, and this girl was walking across the parking lot in a heavy sweater, ski boots, carrying skis, and I thought, she knows something I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the start. It was. Uh, we were. I, I wanted to go to. Uh, there was a, a glacier to ski on. Um, 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 up in the Rockies, and um, and so it was good skiing in September, you know, and then the snow would come, and you'd have the all the skiers and so on. But you you hiked up and would and we skied mm. this glacier together and had a good time and just never lost sight of each other. It was since. the skiing that brought us. It was the skiing that brought us together. Yeah. You could say you were down on the slopes too. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah right. Right. Yeah. right. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So then um, then then you came back here. Right. The Cornish now. Um, you, where did you live first then and, and start your family? Um, we were um, married in the fall of 1972, um, built a, uh, uh, a kit log cabin um, in Etna, and about a year and a half later, um, bought the Goward farm on East Road, and which was uh, pretty much of a ruin on lovely land, and lived there for 26 years. Right. I imagine you, you must have done the renovation of the home then. Um, yep, yeah. uh, with help off and on, but yeah. Yeah. Most of the interior of that house ended up over the bank on the top of the field. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful home. I it, is. it is. It is. We yeah. love living there. We love it living was there. wonderful. Yeah. 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 It was, now, is uh, that where you then you raised your family there? We did. It was, uh, it, it was what we wanted to do. We were um, into, we raised our own beef cow. We had pigs and um, we, I, I love to garden. Um, Peter did the haying of the fields and so on. And it was just where we were and who we were at the time. And um, and uh, uh, just uh, we brought the land back a lot. Um, um, and uh, there was uh, Bud Davis lived up in a farm just out of the flat. And he used to do a lot of the haying. Uh, and uh, he would give us some and he took some. So we just... Um, it, it was just where we were in our heads at that time and just um, uh, wanted to be on a farm. Would you say, you know, at that, that period, there was this back to the earth movement, back yeah. to the land movement in right. Cornish. Right. Hmm. Would you say that you were part of that? We oh, were. absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it, it seemed like everybody um, that we knew, that's what they wanted to do. They were all looking for an old house with um, enough land to raise your own uh, animals and live out of your garden. We used to have two freezers, chock a block full, and um, would um, preserve our own vegetables and so on. And uh, um, it was it, it was just what we wanted to do. Uh, w would you say you were part of a group? I know other people we've interviewed um, have talked about Susan Van Rensselaer. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, a group of people that met together. 
Yeah. Would you say Susan that you... was older than we were. Um, when we first came to town, I would say the people who opened up their arms were um, Milt and um, Milt Jewel and um, and Josie Jewel. We were we used to. There was a, a group that used to like to square dance together, oh. and um, there was square dancing probably once a month down in the town hall and or more or more yeah, yeah. we'd go at down the and, at the town hall and we uh, loved to square dance and and had a great time and um, and then um, then you know as you as as you begin to meet more people uh, we. Uh, we just um, sort of came, uh, friends were like uh, Jill and uh, George Edson became good friends. And so it was, so our friends sort of stretched out and um, we just have had a, a good set of friends in town since since we've been here. When you say stretched out, I, I, if I can apply that to your family as well. Right. Did, didn't, didn't your family follow you up here? Yes. They did. <laughs> they did yeah. <laughs> Yeah, actually, um, my mother um, was um, alone, and she was looking. F uh, she just f felt sort of alone and without family where she was down in Wayland, Massachusetts, where I grew up. And she said, "Caroline, you know, do you know of any place around you?" And so I said, "Mom, I'll look for you." So. I looked at actually we first looked at Bill Caterino's place uh, where he the, lived. The field and, home. Oh. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. And then, and also um, the house down in the flat. And um, mom said, I would rather live in the flat because she never, she learned to drive when she was in her mid forties and she never liked to drive. It was, um, it was uh, um, not something she was comfortable with. So she said, I can walk to the store, I can walk to the post office and I can do everything from the and flat. And she had always lived in a village. And she'd Hatfield always- Hatfield is a village, Wayland was a village. Right. And, um, and the flat appealed to her. Right. Yeah, she um, she was worried about that road up there on Tift Road. Yeah, she didn't, 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 she didn't like want Tift the mud, yeah. so um, so she came uh, about uh, two years after we came, I'd say, mm -hmm. and then my two brothers came and my sister came, so we all came. <laughs> well, you were the first. I was the first. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, just with your mother, one thing I you know I I, I really enjoyed your mother. I, mm -hmm. I would sometimes stop in and talk about the Celtics and or yeah. the Sox, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I I thought you know I'm so glad your mother lived long enough to have the Red Sox win a World Series. Yes. Yes. You know, so many disappointments, you know, yeah, along the way. It was a big one for her. She's yeah, yeah. she was so happy she was alive to see those Sox get the yeah. to win the World Series. Mm -hmm. Just. And then your mother became involved in the community. I mean, she with the historical society. Right. You know, she made friends here. You know. Right. Um, you know, now you were living on East Road. You had children too. Tell us your your children. Right. Well, our firstborn was. Um, we lost our first child, and um, so we. Um, um, and he's actually buried up in the, the little cemetery at uh, on East Road, and then mm -hmm. we had a child soon after that, Nicholas, and he is how old is Nick now? He was born in eighty four. Eighty four, okay. Do the math. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and then um, and then Colin was born uh, eighteen months later. In eighty six. In eighty six, and Hannah was born in nineteen ninety. Ninety. So um, all three children uh, grew up in, on the East Road house. Mm. And then we moved to um, 363 St. Gaudens Road um, in, what year was that? And it was 10, 19, it was 99. We actually moved here into this house That's in right. August uh, 98. And then um, the uh, signed the uh, closed on that house or the the property in um, on January 2nd and he wanted it in for one reason or another and the owner wanted it in the next tax year so no, that was that, that was, would have been 99 January 2nd that was a plat home it Hard is believed it, well no well it's okay. it's it's um, we don't have the architectural plans um, and so that is sort of the the real proof but we are, um, um, I mean, uh, we've had... If it wasn't, it was an amazing copy. <laughs> right. There, you know, every, uh, all of the aspects um, 
that uh, plot included in his houses exist there. And I mean, it, the house isn't set to look right at the mountain, it's offset so a little, um, as his houses are. Um, the uh, uh, linear design of uh, gardens and house crossing um, together are all there. You can, um, uh, the pathways that we didn't uh, dig up and reset on a dry August, you can see them because they're the grass dies over the mm. over the stones. And in fact, it was kind of funny when we were selling the house, uh, we had to get the septic system tested or whatever it is. And the gentleman drove up and he goes, oh, well, this is a Platt house. And we said, well, what makes you say that? And he said, he said, Platt always put this type of manhole cover on all his houses. And, yeah. and we were like, oh, <laughs> right. who would have thought? And he knew right off that it, it Identif was. Ad identified by septic system? system yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and also, too, it was um, the plantings. He, he, he uh, plat liked a bridal wreath, and the gardens were uh, with bridal wreath, and he used um, bayberry to... Uh, uh, barberry? For, barberry for yeah. deer-resistant plants. And uh, so there are just a, a lot of things in the way he set up his pantry and all that sort of thing that were very flat. But there had been some changes at the house interior um, because you could see that some of the walls had been, um, been changed over the course of the 100 years. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, family that owned it before um, the Jenks, they, uh, they said that it was, um, the name of it was, um, uh, uh, Windward was the name of the house. Um, they called it that. Um, so, so the house was, it had a name and so on like that and built in 1905, which the date was up in the attic. Uh, when we did some work up there, we could see the, the date of the house. Magnificent home. Yeah, it was it was a it was a great place. Yeah, a great was, place to live. Yeah, yeah. it yes. was wonderful. Yeah. let's just go back a little and start with uh, uh, with your careers. Um, Peter, you you worked in residential residential construction, mm -hmm. and um, how does one learn that? Tell us how tell us how you learned to uh, that trade. Uh, working for other people, I think, yeah. and um, and paying attention. Um, I got uh, I went to college briefly, and fled. Um, and that was the best paying work that I could find, um, uh, here in the Upper Valley, uh, and worked for other people for maybe eight years mm -hmm. and then, um, uh, seemed to be best to do it um, for myself, which I did with, um, great support from a lot of terrific people. Who, um, Any particular projects you you were, that you might mention or, or that stand out in your mind? Or, uh, um, there there are houses around that I um, that I liked and and things like that. Um, there's uh, um, we were some of them. <laughs> Uh, memories not so happy. We were working um, on uh, Jerry and Colleen's house um, the night it burned, oh. and I was convinced I had set the house on fire and that we'd oh. left something plugged in, or um, uh, and delighted to find out that it um, did not start at the end we were working on. <laughs> that was a, that was a memorable moment. We should say that sounds. Yeah. 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 Um, and then... Uh, then you finished up after remodeling the home after the fire then? Putting things back together. Yes. Yeah, finished the addition that we were doing and, um, you know, cut out what was burned and, and um, uh, put it back together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I know from talking to people, you were very successful. You know, so you're well respected in uh, your work. And oh, it's nice to hear, Lou. <laughs> All right, um, Caroline, now um, you came to be a teacher here. Right, right. Well, I, I quit school after two years and um, came to Cornish. And so I was doing things like um, cleaning houses and all sorts of things. And then a, a friend said, oh, you ought to try subbing. 
you get paid, I don't know what it was, $25 a day or something. So I said, okay, so I signed up for a couple schools and I got involved and I just thought, this is my ticket here. I love this. And I um, got a job. Uh, Dan Poor was the principal of the school and I was hired to be a Title I person. And that's a, um, a reading program. I helped out children with reading needs. And uh, a girl who worked at the school, her name was um, Olivia, Livia Alexion, and she was a special ed person. And she said, you know, Carolyn, you really ought to go to school and get your degree in teaching so that you can really become a full-time certified teacher. So she drove me down to Keene State, and I uh, did another two years at Keene State, got my degree in teaching, got my first job in Cornish teaching back in uh, 1980. I started as a paraprofessional in 1977. Started teaching, and I started with uh, teaching social studies in to fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Um, and then my job sort of, I did everything in the school. I was a special ed teacher because I got a special ed degree as well. I taught um, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade uh, at one time or another. But my favorite was working with the seventh, eighth graders. And eventually my job moved into teaching both language arts and social studies, those two together to seventh and eighth graders. So that was, um, I just, uh, it was a vocation of love. Now I do want to ask you, you won several teaching <laughs> awards. So, you know, don't be shy, no. tell us about those. Well, I, I think yeah. the, the one that I'm the most proud of was I was history teacher of the year for New Hampshire, and um, oh. um, that was um, uh, you. The, uh, a friend encouraged me to do it. Um, I was nominated by a parent in town, and then a friend who was also working, a colleague, said, let me help you, because you have to submit a video of it to what you were doing in the classroom, and then sample um, lesson plans and that sort of thing. So she helped me to put that together, and then I submitted it, and I was chosen. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I was just, um, I felt very honored. Sure, I was, course, it was course. an incredible thing for me. Now, you also were involved in, in, the, in the trips to France, to right. Aspen. You know. right. Tell us about that. Well, um, uh, we started off um, teaching, we had an exploratory program where kids could choose uh, different things to um, other than just straight academics um, uh, um, one day, one afternoon a week. And... Um, uh, and so one of the things we've offered is there was a, a, um, a woman in town who knew French, Annabelle Cohn. She came in and she taught French um, uh, just to familiarize kids just once a week, but it got these kids excited. And uh, they said, well, we want to go to France. And uh, so, so we said, okay. So we, um, we did some fundraising together and the, the four kids went over together. It was Sadie Dvorak, um, Rebecca Barrel, um, um, Lydia Durant, and there was one other child who went. And I took them over and we visited where St. Gaudens was um, born in Aspe, French, which is down by the Pyrenee, Pyrenees. And then we went to Paris for a little while. Uh, and it was about a 10 day trip. We had a great time, came back. And then there was this real push to put French, the French language in the school system. And um, some parents in town, um, in fact, Laura Scharf was involved and um, uh, uh, Sue Borchard um, put together a, a grant for three years from the national, uh, from the government. And it was a full-time French program that was introduced to the school. Mm -hmm. And part of that was taking the kids to France. And we uh, got a twinning going between the two towns and uh, it was a um, it it was a, an extraordinary program that these kids were exposed to, and um, so they visited um, France, and then uh, French kids would come over and do homestays here with us here mm -hmm. in Cornish. So um, so that program sort of deteriorated once um, the support for the foreign language sort of fell by the wayside when um, you know things budgetary things got tight. The, the French program was was dropped, and so we started to take the kids to Washington, D.C. 
as a drip. Recently, I've come across the uh, in our vertical files the Aspect newsletter. Oh, okay. You know that was written. You know, so it prompted mm -hmm. me, you know, I was ah. going to see you today about that. Uh -huh. Basically, the link to St. Gordon's is the real link. There, yes, right? yes. yes. Um, there was a woman who um, was from. Um, uh, let's see. She was from the uh, near the area of Aspe, and she was um, very interested in creating this twinning between the two towns. And uh, she was an enormous help of trying to get this um, um, relationship going between the town of Cornish, with um, with uh, uh, because she had a love of Augustus St. Gaudens and his works and so on, and then getting the, the um, school involved in it and the town. Right, because you started off, the first trip was four girls. Right. And by the time the program ended, you were going in a group of 25 or 30. It was a whole class who went. Yeah. To, yeah. Right. So it was, it was yeah. Didn't you so say it was, took some organization. It did, yeah. <laughs> um, didn't you say then, because of 9-11, parents... We can't then became reluctant to have their children going. Right. I think so. Less comfortable. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah there, and then it, you went to the, the Washington trips. Then. Right. It mm -hmm. was, that was a very small group of children. There were only about 11 in that class. And they, and 9-11 had just happened. The parents were just, they they were getting very, they were nervous about going overseas. So, so that the idea of going down to Washington, D.C. came up and that became um, the trip that we did with the eighth graders and then that became the traditional trip that the eighth graders then took, coinciding with the fact that the French program was sort of collapsing here in town, too. I see, I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's move that now to, um, to your volunteer work uh, that went beyond day-to-day -day, you know, jobs. Um, Peter, you've been on the planning, you were on the planning board for... A long period of time. Yep. Okay. Um, t t give us a, a view in terms of what does a planning board do in, in a town like this? And, I think uh, we were we were lucky in Cornish that um, uh, when zoning was being offered um, uh, to various towns around Lebanon and Hanover, um, were interested in um, creating a zoning. Um, program in, in their towns and, and protecting uh, whatever made their towns unique. Stanley Judkins lived um, here at the foot of the hill and um, and he ran a company called Invico and it was a planning group that wrote zoning ordinances for, um, for towns and I think we got ours essentially free. Right. which was um, uh, quite a gift and uh, started off with the planning board um, taking minutes on the back of envelopes and think of used envelopes and things like that um, and that was were, were you then one of the first I was not um, they started in uh, uh, 1972 I think um, I think Peter, Peter Berlin was a charter the, member yeah. Um, uh, there were, I should be able to list most of them. Betty Macy was right. involved from the very beginning. Polly Manette was involved from the very beginning right. with, um, uh, and it was a, it was a smaller group. It was five, um, people then, um, without alternates. Now it's larger group, still uh, still five members and with two alternates. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, ordinances have evolved along the year, through the years. Um, uh, we've had uh, several uh, master plan um, revisions, um, probably fewer than we were supposed to by law because it's a huge amount of work. There's one going on now, um, which will be available pretty soon. Um, and like that, the um, overriding uh, tenor or theme was uh, that came up 
over and over in any survey that we did, any um, forum that we held, or uh, was that um, uh, Cornish should attempt to change as li physically change as little as possible. Um, Protect the rural character was. That's the big I think that's exactly the term. Yeah. That, um, People used, and I think the ordinance reflects that. And uh, we work hard um, to encourage people to hold open land, um, uh, manage woodlands, um, make it easier to own um, larger blocks of land than uh, you might own elsewhere, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I was on the zoning board, and am still on the zoning board. You are, are yourself? Yeah. 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 And um, um, I, I think I was first on with Bill Balch, as I think has more years than I, and he is uh, he's a good, um, steady uh, member of the zoning board of adjustment. You know, when I, I've done other interviews and I've asked people, how has Cornish changed? And they say, it's pretty much stayed the same. The big change they notice are the roads. Oh, they're better. The roads are much better now. Yes, you know, they are. Yeah. yeah, we were just saying that, that, you know, usually um, Hannah one time was coming home from school and uh, she, she bottomed that, the van right down to the, to the, right down to the axles and Peter had to take the truck on down. The uh, just on I mean, I mean, the spring. money roads. Yeah, yeah, the money roads in, in March or something or other. And, uh, and now, I mean, we... We can't believe it. You can get home and there's no problems. So it's, it is very different. Caroline, I'm, I don't want to leave anything out, but um, I know that you've been also, you mentioned the zoning board, very active in the community. Um, and you've been in the, with the Historical Society, right. you know, following the example of your mother. Right. Um, and you're very much involved in the meeting house now, right. in the flat. Right. And you obtained an LCHIP grant. We which, did. You know, well, first of all, tell us about the meeting house. You and Susan Chandler and George Edson. Um, right. Yeah. Well, uh, back in, um, I believe it was 1975. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, around in there. Uh, the, um, the, the Cornish Baptist Church it, it was the... It was a Cornish Baptist church, and then the brick church in the center were together, and those churches combined. And they were, that congregation just could not um, uh, maintain both churches. So they didn't know what to do with, they decided to keep the brick church that was on Center Road, but um, give up the the church in Cornish Flat. And they... Um, at one point, there was talk about taking it down. They were going to dismantle it. There was they were talking about selling it as a convenience store that the the property come, become a convenience store. So there were a group of us in town, and it was George Edson, Je, George Edson, uh, Don Saunders, and uh, Sandy Powers. She, um, she Sandy and Don Powers owned a Powers Country Store. Oh. And the four of us got together and said, "Let's save this thing." So we uh, um, approached the, the selectmen and said, um, we will take this over and, and, and save this building. Uh, and the selectmen, um, Mike Yatsevich was the select person at the time, Fred Sullivan and Myron Quimby, and they supported us um, and it was sold to the town for a dollar. And um, we vowed that we would try our best not to use tax dollars to, to try to keep this thing going. And so we had an auction and we've tried to raise money all of our, uh, ourselves and so on. And um, it, uh, it had a big influx of money about three years ago because um, uh, we had an engineer's report done and the steeple is, was actually um, uh, moving into the building. Uh, it was structurally not sound, and we probably saved it just at the right moment. And um, uh, Rich Thompson did an amazing amount of work on it. He did a fantastic job. Uh, we had um, um, a donation from an anonymous source who was very generous to us and, um, and helped preserve the building. And then um, to, to continue that, we um, uh, 
um, submitted an LCHIP grant, which is from the state of New Hampshire. And, and, and that's from, I think it's money that comes from, uh, money from current land use that goes to the state. They then use it to, uh, to put back into the resources in the state. And we um, acquired that money, and it was around fifty thousand dollars from uh, from the state, fifty thousand dollars that we raised ourselves, and it was a so a total of a hundred thousand dollars. And we um, uh, had the slate roof repaired, the building totally um, uh, refurbished on the outside, so it's it's good and strong structurally, um, and uh, just uh, has. We, we want to make sure that the building is left for the next generation in good shape. So that's sort of what our, our, our goals are right now. And it's Susan Chandler and uh, George Edson and myself who are the, the, the committee working on it. And you work with the Historical Society because the Historical Society, that was their first real home there too, right. in the basement there. Right, and yes. when um, when we got the original funds um, back in from raising this from an auction and so on, we we did get some money from the state back then from the Preservation Society, um, and that was part of it was is to to give a room to the historical society because they had no place to put their artifacts, and so we worked with Virginia Colby, Steve Tracy at the time was an architect, he did the architectural plans for it, and so the corn the historical society had a place to put their artifacts. They then obviously have moved to the School Street, um, the old um, town office building, which is great because it can be heated and it's a much better source for them. But it's they, they, the historical society still has- We have an exhibit still. Yes. As we, we opened up when, when you had that open day. Right. Opening day too, yes, right. yes. Now also, um, I know you've been involved with the, uh, the Friends of St. Gordon's. Yes. St. Gordon's Memorial, tell us about that. Yeah. Um, the uh, when um, uh, St. Gaudens was uh, was when Augustus St. Gaudens died, his wife set up um, an organization to keep his memory alive, and it was called the St. Gaudens Memorial. And um, the memorial back in um, I believe it's 1962. Uh, couldn't do it alone, so it was offered to um, the national government, which um, then became partners with the memorial to keep the legacy of Augusta St. Gaudens going. So there's a board that um, works with the national park to to keep to uh, to to to, uh, to to cooperate and add ideas, um, but they don't do the day-to-day -day running. The memorial doesn't, but they add ideas. They do the concerts and and so on like that. And I was um, um, asked to be a, um, um, a, a board member and I did that for about 20 years and enjoyed it very much. And um, um, it was, um, I learned a lot and uh, fascinating people on the board. Are you still on the board? I didn't no, know. I, um, um, I, when I retired, I got off. <laughs> Were you involved in the purchase of the Bloby Down Farm area? Yes, Where yes, yeah. That was um, that was uh, 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 John Dreifau, um was able to help with some of the coordination of it, um, but then the, it was given to the to the memorial, and uh, it was the memorial has been sort of um, uh, dealing with it over the years of what do we do with it, and finally the decision was made to donate it to the National Historic Site. And because the, the memorial itself did not have the, the, um, the funds to keep this going. So with it now being part of the Park Service, um, hopefully- What do you think be, will happen to it? Well, I, I, I think when the survey that they did is they would like to, the, most of the input from the surveys came back saying that um, people would like to see it as a, uh, a, a the Cornish um, colony uh, can be highlighted there, so it gives context to, uh, to for Augustus St. Gaudens, how he, who he was working with, who were the colleagues that he was with, um, who was in this area at the time, and and they have a lot of artifacts from the the different um, colonists who were here, so it would would help to to supplement them to supplement it, yeah, and give a. Uh, uh, um, 
give some context to who who, who was about and doing things because he didn't work alone in in, in solitary. There were just yeah. I mean you think about and you preserve aspects of the Beeman presence too. Right. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so as sort of a like an overview, I think Peter, with, with all your work with the planning board, I would I would say that you've been very successful, you know, in maintaining the the Cornish mm -hmm. that, that people have known for years. Um, that I, that there doesn't seem to be the great changes that you've witnessed. That, you know, maybe a little before your time, but you know, West Lebanon with you know, with all the box stores, that was those were fields mm -hmm. you know, at one time, agricultural right. fields. Uh, but you have you and others, of course, have preserved Cornish. You know, so. Now, not that you have not preserved the educational <laughs> system, but but there, now there's an area uh, with schools that there has been great change. Um, with the uh, declining enrollment. Um, tell us about that. Tell us what your views are. Uh, tell us about the future, you think, of the school, of the enrollment. And um, the, it, it's funny, when I first came, I can't remember how many there were, but I remember at one point we went up to about 250 kids in the school. And you have to remember, we didn't have um, the added kindergarten room. And Oh my goodness, it was, I mean, I had classes of 32 kids. Uh, it was just chocker block full. And we used to even do plans of how to dismiss the kids because we had to rotate them because they all couldn't be in the hallway at the same time. I mean, the, the school was just, just um, uh, it, there were a lot of kids in that school. But with the declining enrollment, I'm, and he, he, Peter and I have talked about it and why and so on, and... We just, our opinion is, is that kids seem to be um, less interested in being rural in rural areas. That, I mean, we even look at our own children and they're all heading towards bigger cities. Um, Hannah's in Montreal, Colin was in Toronto, um, Nick is down around um, New York City, outside of New York City. And, and, and even in our own nieces and nephews, they're all heading towards larger um, areas, and and it's the pendulum has just won. When we were uh, here in Cornish, we were one of many who wanted to go back to to go back to the land and that sort of movement. And the pendulum has swung. To kids want to be in in urban areas, and they want to be uh, where the action is. And they and who knows, the pendulum could swing back just as hard and fast as well, we have Billy before. Sharp. Exactly. Billy Sharp is, is here with a young family. Right, but, yeah. right. And, and that's yeah. the good sign is, you know, you've got uh, uh, Corey Fitch, Cor you've got Bill, you've got a lot of um, uh, kids coming, some right. kids coming back. I think with Cornish them. has always had a um, remarkably high percentage of um, kids who grew up here and uh, either go away for a while and come back or stay. And um, I, I, again, the reasons for that are um, unique to every individual. It's not, I don't think there's a uh, um, strong sociological trend there. It's just interesting that, um, and maybe there is, you know. Do you think um, that Cornish has been so successful in terms of preserving its open space? Mm -hmm. Um, has that acted as a deterrent for population growth that with families that would come into to the school with, the, with young children? I don't think so. Um, we have, um, uh, most of Cornish has a minimum of five acres. Five acres. Um, if you're going to subdivide land off a bigger parcel. Uh, until recently, there were exclusions that allowed um, uh, two acres. Um, that uh, was voted out of the um, uh, ordinance maybe 10 years ago. Um, they, uh, but the cost of creating a house um, has little to do with um, lot size. A lot, I think, or I've always felt a building lot is what it is, and whether it's five acres or two, there isn't a gigantic difference in the cost of that land. And the costs are 
in driveway and well and septic system and um, improvements even well before you start digging a hole and building a house. It's um, the uh, there's um, there has always been available land for sale in Cornish um, of, with various degrees of affordability. But if um, but it, it's a hard thing to an expensive thing to um, uh, buy land, improve it, and build a house on it. Yes. And also, too, um, I think that if we were unique to this whole, um, to the state, then, you know, you'd start to question what you, your own beliefs. But Vermont is uh, having the same problem with declining enrollment. New Hampshire is, uh, except for the southern tier. And Maine, we heard about this in Maine eight years ago or so. Or, um, yeah, or well before, well before it really the, yeah. became noticeable in Cornish. And we just started. And so it's 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 a real um, Upper New England um, phenomenon that's happened. So it's uh, uh, so many towns are dealing with it. So it's 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 I think it's the yeah. young people just deciding that maybe this is not the area for them, but they could come back. <laughs> <laughs> You know, um, I think we're getting pretty close to the end of the things that I wanted to ask you, but I did want to uh, also uh, say that uh, you've acquired the reputation as world travelers. Mm. You know, you, you do a lot of traveling now, and I know you were in Italy. Tell us about some of your past trips and then uh, things you have planned in the future. Or uh... um, Well, we, I guess we just decided when we're, because we're retired now, we have and the opportunity that made a huge difference yeah um having um not selling your life by the hour right. to other people <laughs> <coughs> frees up a lot mm. and um and not having to go on school vacations all the time because if you go on a school yes. vacation it's tough to travel but um, being able to go on off times is fantastic so um and we've always uh We've always wanted to travel, always liked to travel, and uh, so it's... Do you have any trips coming up, a planned, or...? A... Uh, no, we've got we a wedding in... coming this summer. We're... Colin oh. is getting married, oh, so right. that's what oh. we're concentrating on right now. I suppose it's helped, too. I mean, this is a smaller home than what you had before. Right, right. You know, and uh, it's new, right? I mean, so the upkeep has to be considerably less, right? Right, yeah. Yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, and this actually was here. We put an addition on to oh, it, but it, it was an old... It. Um, was it? Um, Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Jenks built it um, back in 1972 or something or other. Are we... Just when you look at the home, the front part, is this the... This the, is the new part. The, you're yeah. in a new building. Yeah, and that's the but old that part is, right there. Okay. No. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so yeah, she built it um, for her caretaker to live I, in. I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you have, and you have solar panels too? You and we have solar. solar panels, right. We yeah. were um, the, the town-wide um, solar push. Three years ago. Yeah, we, um, we um, signed up. We're happy we did. Good for you. Yeah, it's been great. Has that worked out? Yeah. Very well. Very well, so, yeah. And um, again, it may be impacted by the cost of a wedding or two, but it's, uh, I th we're um, researching at the moment, expanding it. It um, covers about half the cost, provides a little more than half the cost of um, the electricity for this building, and um, no particular reason why it shouldn't um, be, at least if not, Carbon neutral, at least electricity neutral. Mm. Good. Yeah. Well, um, is there anything else you would like to add? I've been asking the questions. Yeah, or, no, you know, no, it's no. been very enjoyable, yeah. and uh, yeah. you know, I, I, you know, learned quite a lot. Anything else, Peter, that you'd like to add? Or I'll I say? don't think so. <laughs> okay. Well, at the end, I always turn to Billy, and I always say, "Well, Billy, that's <laughs> that's a take." So, thank you very much. <laughs>